There are 168 hours in every week, and most of us only use one to know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. And this week, Pastor Jake and I are going to do a Bible study live so that we can show you how to utilize the rest of the time in your week to study God's word and hear a word from him. And we're also going to check in on Job. Welcome to the 167. Welcome back to the 167. We are here today with the Pastor Jake Reeves. Not to be confused with a Pastor Jake Reeves, the. I appreciate the distinction. And not the Pastor Jake Reeves either. It's the. The. That is so much more formal and so much more than I deserve. Thou thou art thou. here on the podcast. <laughs> And uh, today what we are doing is we actually started a new series. So yeah. you kicked it off. What was yeah. it called? It is called How to Christian. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm. So yeah. we're figuring out how do we do this thing? It's practical steps because we do a lot of platitudes sometimes as Christ followers. We were like, oh, just have a relationship with God. Like, what does that mean? Yeah. Read your Bible. How? Like, what does yeah. that mean? Like, other than just going, like, how are we supposed to read it? Yeah. So. We thought that we would do a little experiment today. It is an experiment of experiments. I love it. So we're we are actually going to study something with you live. So you've heard it here first. <laughs> and we literally just picked what it was because we want to be in it as much as you guys are. Yeah, we're so, like, what are we gonna do? Yeah. So um, I'm excited about this. Yeah. And this was actually it was born out of the idea. Um, I really wanted to do this physically in the sermon and um, couldn't happen. Couldn't happen. I already went over for my time, and not enough time. <laughs> not enough time. Um, but uh, that's why that's why I love that we got the one sixty seven because we can dig into stuff like this and uh, kind of an hour on Sunday is not enough. You need the other one sixty seven. It's true, though. We we need an hour for preaching. I'm just kidding. You heard it here first. Dang. Not really. Uh. <laughs> All right. So what are we studying? All right. So um, we're gonna we're gonna start right at the beginning of John because that was. Um, something I had mentioned, uh, you know, for a lot of beginning uh, people who are trying to engage with Scripture, um, rather than you know jumping back into Leviticus or um, you know any of the minor prophets or something. Like we're going to start with John. Uh, it's it's got some crucial stuff for us to understand. And um, once you really get into it, um, which you know we're not going to get deep into it, but once you get into it, it's it's an easy read and it's it's enjoyable because you get to see who Jesus is, you get to see what he does. Yeah. And some people are watching, and some people are listening. What mm-hmm. are the tools that you have in front of you? Okay. So what I have in front of me, and obviously, um, uh, it's it's a little unique today because it uh, was what we could carry. Yeah, it's what we could carry, <laughs> and I, I have different levels of how I how I engage. So, like for my my morning time with, uh, you know, with Scripture, with Jesus, mainly it's my Bible and my phone, um, and primarily my Bible. Like, if I need something, I can pull it up, um, but it's more a just straight digestion um, thing. Uh, but if I encounter something during that time, or if I'm specifically, uh, if I'm building services, or um, I'm interested, or I'm leading a group or something, um, I pull my handy dandy um, laptop out and uh, do a little bit more in-depth uh, study, um, you know, so I can have uh, you know parallel versions up. I can pull up uh, the Greek and stuff. Um, I I know uh, this is where we kind of have our different worlds. But we've, uh, you have Bible Hub, right? I do. Is that what you have up. So what I have, I brought a bunch of stuff. If you can watch on the podcast or you can listen, I'm going to show a few things. So this is actually a Greek lexicon. Ooh. Don't, don't use this. Yeah. You notice how unused. <laughs> it's like, it sits wonderfully it's upon your shelf. Pristine condition. Don't use that. Here's the message by Eugene Peterson, which mm-hmm. you mentioned in yep. your um, sermon. And it's really a kind of a storybook yeah. type of interpretation of the Bible. It's not word for word interpretation, yeah. but it's great oh. for like reading it just devotionally and seeing the story of the yep. Bible. You want to understand things. I got 
NIV, the trusty NIV. Dude, mm, rock NIV solid. NIV is solid. Yep. Um, so this is a lot of what you guys grew up with. When we say NIV, NLT, these are all different versions. It's different people that have interpreted yeah. the old language. New, the new international version. Yeah, the new international version. And then I have the NASB. I mostly preach out of the NLT, the mm -hmm. New Living Translation. Um, and then I brought a fun thing that my dad got me for Christmas, um, which is called the TLV. It's the Tree of Life version. And it's actually... Um, After that movie? Yes, um, Tree of Life. <laughs> no, it's uh, at a gateway uh, Christian church. They have a, a Jewish community that meets at their church. And so it is actually a New Testament written by Jewish rabbis. That is very interesting. That indeed. are Christ followers. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's really interesting. It helps me. Uh, and the reason I have so many different versions is kind of the same reason uh, that you do. Um, I have a Bible. I use Bible Hub, but I also use Bible Gateway. Yeah. Because it's an easy yeah, drop down yeah, yeah. menu. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so I'm using, uh, and this is, it, it's really clunky, so I don't know that I necessarily highly recommend it, but it was... Um, what was used in my schooling, uh, stepbible.org, uh, which was a, a free one compiled with a bunch of commentaries as Matthews and everything on it. Stepbible.org? Stepbible.org. Org, okay. So, um, it sounds like there was a divorce, but okay. Yeah, I know. It, it's not the full, you know, it's not the half Bible, it's a step Bible. <laughs> it's a step Bible. Um, but I've spent time with it, so I'm used to it. And I'm flying a little blind today because my... Uh, my study Bible's at home, so I'm just like straight up, just good old NLT sitting in front of me. Um, I have like a thousand NIVs. I think I have like a teen one I got on like Promotion Sunday mm -hmm. and all that stuff at home. So, uh, but yeah. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so I don't know if, uh, because we don't really have a structure, I say I'll read a little bit and then um, I can kind of talk you through and anything that pops out, uh, you let's can kind of jump in. And, and so starting in the beginning of John, uh, Maybe a familiar verse that a lot of you've heard. And again, I'm reading out of the NLT. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. And so um, right there already, I'm like, I'll stop. If, if I was reading through this, and this is my very first read, you know, read through of anything, I'd be like, okay, so we're talking about the Word, and... Um, like I'd be really going through and highlighting some stuff just for myself as, as I talked about this past Sunday, um, I'm now big into underlining, um, you're going to write in your Bible. I am going to write in my Bible. Uh, my, my soul has found peace. I found healing in this. And so an interesting thing is you see that it starts out in the beginning, which man, that sure sounds a lot like another place in scripture. Uh, and so my mind is immediately drawn to that. Then I'm like, okay, this, the word, uh, is there. Um, at the beginning, and so, granted, I have to kind of fight the the notion that like I've been in Christianity so long that my mind's immediately like, oh, I know who the Word is. Like, mm -hmm. and so if you're reading through this and you're like, who's the Word? Hang on, it it lets you know. Right. <laughs> so. Well, and it's it's interesting <laughs> to think about it because a lot of times we think, well, Jesus was the Word. And it's like, no, no, the Word existed, and He became. We called Him Jesus. Yeah. But like you said, that's what I'm doing too. Is I'm looking for phrases and words. Mm -hmm that pop out to me. And a lot of times what I can do to identify those words is, so I've got Bible Gateway popped up. Yep. And so I'm reading along with you. And then there's a little drop down menu that I pull it up and there's like 50 different interpretations, but I got a few that I, I yeah. can kind of, so I flipped over to the Amplified Bible. And so the Amplified Bible says in the beginning and in print in kind of captions, it says before all time. So before time again, was the word and it says Christ. And the word was with God and the word was God himself. He was, and it says continually existing in the beginning, co-eternally with God. And I'm going, what the, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm going, what, what are they doing here? And so if you're really like, really into this, like I'm, I'm preaching, <laughs> what I do is I end up in Google. I really don't know. Like I use biblehub.com all the time. Yeah, I yeah. don't know how to use the site. The site is super clunky. What I do is I go to google.com. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I type the word interlinear. So it's I-N-T-E-R-L-I-N-E-A-R, interlinear. Uh, and then I type the verse. So John 1. Yeah. And then it, the first thing that will come up is yeah, Bible Hub, interlinear. Oh, yeah. And then yep. I click on it and it shows me a page where 
It is the original Greek with an interpretation. So I can sit here and read it. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. But it's going in, apa, et, al, logos, kai. You know, so it's like yeah, yeah. it's showing it top and bottom. Mm-hmm. And then each word, you can click on it. So if I'm in the Amplified Bible and it says, in the beginning, before all time. So I can actually click on this word. It's like Archie. So it's uh, in the beginning. And I'll click on the little number. It says 646. So it has like a little number that's assigned to it. And then it'll come up and it'll say, you know, a quasi-personal sense, rulers, beginning. And then it'll give me every verse yeah. that it translates it. So um, so that's why I kind of do if I'm going, something's fishy here. Yeah. This word, somebody, some people think this word means this. Some people think the word means this. Oh, man. I'll go back and use that as a tool to kind of look it up. So when I originally thought I was maybe going to be able to, uh, so I wanted to take eight minutes or so in the sermon and literally run, run people through, uh, you know, a couple verses in John. Like, my intention was to do this because I was, you know, throwing it out there for people. And yeah, that wasn't possible uh, for time. And so in the little bit that I did, you know, I was like, oh, you know, to kind of whet the appetite of people who are going to go deeper like this, who are going to take time and they want to, you know, look at the interlinear and stuff. Um, I did a little bit of a dive on just, you know, logos and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, it's it's just the amount of papers written on it, the amount of everything. It's just, it's vast. Um, you could just sit here for a week and study that. Um, but, but I pulled something cool away from it that I love that was just a simple um, explanation uh, for me uh, that I was like, oh man, that, that's a really good image where it says, uh, uh, I'm pulling this from my head, uh, you know, words are simply the outward expression of the inward idea. Yeah, it's and, an embodiment of an idea. And so, you know, when you take that, we, we get so used to the Christianese of the word, the word, and to think like, no, like God, you know, he's invisible and uh, like in a sense, he's an idea. He's, he's something that we, we can't grasp, but, you know, Jesus, the, the word, it became something expressible. It came, became something that we can like understand and, and, and read and, and at, at the time of Jesus, they could touch him and, yeah, and like. It becomes something that we can, con- you, we can process in our dimensional reality. Yeah. And so it was like, oh, you know, that's great. And that was just in somebody's random one-off thing while they were going way deeper on it. And I'm mm-hmm. just like, oh man, I, I, that's going to help me explain it to people who don't sit with this stuff all the time. Right. And so. So that's what you end up with is back in First John. It's like in the beginning. So like before time ever began, before dinosaurs, before the world, anything like that was the embodiment of God. So yeah. even though God is this abstract concept, his physical manifestation in Jesus Christ was still there. Yeah. And it was with God and it is God himself. It's just a physical embodiment of that. Yeah. And so that's what you end up with. And I'm glad that we've done one verse so far. I know. And <laughs> so the first part of John is so theologically deep. Um, like, obviously, if it's your very first time, very, very first time reading, like I, I pulled up. The other thing I have, I have my phone here um, and I have the um, the Bible apps, John. Uh, th- the reading just, plan. Yeah, the reading plan and like the devotional I have with it. It's great because it says here, like Jesus is the initiator of everything, the universe, our lives, our salvation. Um, all were created and conceived by Jesus, um, which which is great truth to speak into this and to kind of prepare you as you read it. Because so many people are like, if they have if they don't understand that Jesus was there before time, they're like, oh yeah, Jesus came on the scene, you know? Yeah, he was born when, as a baby in a manger, yeah, like yeah, six thousand years after happened. this thing started. <laughs> so so up to that point, it was just kind of the father hanging out up there, and he's like, Jesus, you get down there, and then uh, and so there's a lot happening here. Uh, well, and I want to point out too. <laughs> If this is confusing, it is because the scriptures actually say um, people will read this and they won't understand mm-hmm. it unless you ask the Holy Spirit to explain yes. it to you. And so one of the steps that we kind of skipped in this is if I'm doing this, I have worship music on in the background. Yeah. And a lot of times it's, I try and do, um, I don't even know how, I usually search instrumental and then hill song, instrumental, elevation, instrumental, because yeah. there's instrumental versions of it out, out there. Or if you go to YouTube, you can literally type soaking music Yeah. and it'll come up with some three hour long pad, you know, and so it's just like, you kind of are in that zone. And then I pray, Lord, what do you want me to hear here? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you, what do you want me to see in this? And then I start. Yeah. I totally didn't follow my own sermon where I was like, Hey, before we get in this, we're (laughs) well, you usually don't do with a microphone with a a friend. I know. (laughs) I know. I'm like, so, um, 
but yeah, yeah, like the, the Holy Spirit is absolutely uh, crucial in this. And so, um, and that's, that's like, that's a really tough thing that's, you know, doing a series like this saying like, hey, we're going to show you how, but you need the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, and this is the great thing too, though. It's like, even when we're doing, we're, right now we kind of did a deep dive on the first verse. Yeah. So let's take it more like, this is my devotional reading. Yeah. Like I'm just reading through. And so. So let's pick it up in verse two. Yeah. So we're in verse two. Uh, he existed in the beginning with God. And I'm like, all right. Uh, God created everything through him and nothing was created except uh, through him. And here, I'm all I'm reflecting on is just legitimately like, wow, I know this is Jesus. And I'm like, Jesus is crucial even at the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. that, and that's it. Um, and, uh, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm underlining that. I might underline this whole passage. Who knows? Uh, the word gave life. We're in verse four now. The word gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Um, so here... Man, I've already kind of got a sense that like he's there at the beginning. Um, I understand light and darkness, and I'm like, light's good. I don't like darkness, and he's you know, he's gonna persevere. He's you know, yeah. And yeah. He puts it in mankind, and he puts it in creation, mm -hmm. and it's basically saying there's never going to be a part a point where darkness completely overcomes us. That there is no more mankind anymore because yep. darkness overcame it. There's not. We're not going to destroy the earth like. There's not going to be a nuclear apocalypse where everything on earth dies yep. because that would be the darkness overcoming the light. We're going to continue this thing until God says it's done. Right. Uh, so, which can speak that God's in control. Um, and so now we move into uh, verse six, um, uh, where it kind of <laughs> at least backs off a little bit of the sort of deep, deep. Uh, it says, God sent a, sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. It's like, all right, there's a dude named John the Baptist that, uh, that was on a mission. Um, John himself was not the light. Okay, John's not the savior. Got it. Check. Um, he was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, uh, was coming into the world. Well, and what's interesting too, so to go back to, like I'm following along right now in the interlinear. Oh, nice. And uh, what's funny is when it talks that it's going to be his testimony, the word is um, the same word for martyr. Mm, it's yeah. maturio. And so it's like his, and you're just like his testimony. It's like, oh, that's nice. He's going to talk about it. And it's like Wait. John died. He was beheaded yeah. for Christ. For the, the lamest circumstances ever. Oh, yeah. Um, but that's a whole other story. Uh, no spoilers there for you. Uh, <laughs> so like, I'm just picking it, like I said, when you go through there, it's like, oh yeah, there's just these little tidbits mm -hmm. and the same thing when it's like, and he in the light, but that he might witness the, cons the witness, all that was concerning the light. It's the same word that he might martyr, that he might witness or bear testimony to that. All right. So was I in verse 10? I think so. Okay. Uh, so moving on in verse 10 and it says he came into this very world he created. So we know that it's still talking about the light here. Uh, I know since we've been kind of jumping around, not John the Baptist, mm -hmm. uh, he came into the uh, very world he created, uh, but the world didn't recognize him, um, which matches what I talked about in the sermon. What we talked about here, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, it's just not going to click. Yeah. Um, he came to his own people and even they rejected, rejected him. Again, if you don't know scripture, it's like, oof, you know, like you read how amazing he is and his own people didn't take him in. Uh, but to those who believed him and accepted him, uh, he gave the right to become children of God. Whoa. Um, and, you know, we're all children on some level. Uh, we've been a child, uh, hopefully, if you yeah. if you haven't. And um, I don't, I, I didn't bring that. my study Bible either, but here in the Amplified Bible, it's got some really good clarifying things. It says in that verse, he came to that which was his own. And then it always has these little parentheses. Yeah. It says that which belonged to him, his world, his creation, his possession. And those were those who were his own people, and in parentheses, the Jewish nation, mm -hmm. did not receive and welcome it. So it's like, it's kind of, the Amplified Bible and Study Bible have these great little additives that clarify those things yep. for you. If, if you're studying this for the very first time, you're like, what people? Like, what is it? Like, us? Like, it's like, no. He, Hang on. No. Yeah. yeah. No. Uh, brackets, right? Yeah. Aren't they like the little, little yeah. brackets. Uh, so they are reborn, not with a physical birth uh, resulting from human passion or plan, but from a birth that comes from God. Um, and so we see that all this is coming from God at this point, and it kind of destroys the whole notion where some people are like, well, how can I be reborn again? Like, you know, okay, Nicodemus. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> uh, 
Um, all right, so we've made it through 13. You can see how it clips way more. Like you can either bog down and mm -hmm. spend a little bit of time in a couple verses, or you you know you can go super deep for not a long time, or you can go you kind bigger of bigger sections, kind of pulling larger here, and so. And we're gonna we're gonna have to wrap this up pretty soon, so we can't go super deep into it. But so you've read this, mm -hmm. and I'm going. So what's the follow up to that? Is it a prayer of God, man? Thank you, thank you for doing this. Like, what do I do? So I, I read this, and my time is up. I got to go shower and get ready in the mm -hmm. morning. And so I'm closing my Bible. What do I do? All right. So if I'm closing my Bible, let, let's say that you know my goal was verse 18, but I didn't make it. Again, we said whatever you accomplish, that's still yeah. something accomplished. Is time spent. Like if I'm just there, um, I'm I'm already the focus is on Jesus. There, it's it's on the Word. Um, uh, I'm walking away with from that just being in a sense of amazement and realizing um, reliance on God, realizing. And so my prayer is is really going to be a prayer of focus for the day. Where, I, you know, I'm going to say, God, man, I I just see that Jesus is holding it all together, um, and I, I I it's clear that I need you for today. It's clear that I need um, the Creator of the universe. Uh, the one that the brings light into the darkness um, and just pray for for strength and, and wisdom out of that passage. And then I'm going to chew on it. Um, and you can pray for that silently. Oh, yeah, I usually yeah. recommend to people that you actually pray out loud. I think it slows down your thoughts mm -hmm. and you can go and it treats Jesus like a person yeah. that he can hear you. Uh, you mentioned in your sermon writing, so you could write a little letter. So so I write mine. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's been sort of my the same thing. It slows you down uh, where... Um, it slows you way down because <laughs> because you have to sit there, dearest Jesus. I, and you know, it's I, been a fortnight since I, we spoke last. I don't full full you know go uh, hard formal, but it, it's definitely. Um, I'm trying to think. I was in First um, Corinthians six or seven today, and um, I was I was just reflecting on Paul's writing, and, and and so I was responding, and I kind of did a one to two sentence like. Hey, here's what I read today, and then how I hoped that it would impacted me, um, and that was it. You know, mm -hmm. like, um, and then the rest of the time I was spent praying for people, praying for situations, uh, thanking God for stuff. Um, it didn't all just revolve around that. Obviously, that right. that was the challenge too, where we spent. Um, you know, the focus was on how to read the Bible, but there's so much more. Um, like with soaking and so much more with what your prayer life looks like, but mm -hmm. that wasn't the focus. We'll get for to today. that. That wasn't the focus for today, right? So, and so, like I said, you can walk away with that, but that pu that puts a lens on your prayer mm -hmm. life. It um, is something that's hopefully helpful, and we want to tell you guys this is not to overwhelm you. Yeah, uh, what we've done is kind of set out a buffet, and so the challenge is not to eat off every tube in the buffet. No, it is to go. Okay, well, there's a couple of websites that I can use. There's, we just mentioned a reading plan in the Bible um, Bible uh, app or whatever, Bible.com. And so going, okay, so what you can do is you can sit down, write in your Bible, you can journal a little bit, you can do a reading plan. But the fact, like even like when we did the study tools, I don't do all of that in one sitting every day. So, no, 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 no. So what we're challenging you to do is to start somewhere and to do something that edifies your spirit and helps you come closer to Christ. It's the uh, um, spiritual couch to 5K. If, yeah. if you have any familiarity with that, um, it basically starts you out walking. It starts you out. Um, it, it, it's not to say that you can't dive deep and that the Holy Spirit isn't going to you know, bless that time. But man, like just spending that, that base time in is going to, it's going to totally change stuff. And you're going to want this. Yeah. Doing you, something. When you start, and, and that's the thing that I really hope people got is when you start and you keep it consistent and you're doing 10, 15 minutes, um, you're going to start to want more than that because you're 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 going to want to know, you know, here, you know, when we talked about the Holy Spirit's voice, you know, like that, that starts here and then it moves into your own time. Um, and I always say, like, so, I show up to the gym and people are like, do you have goals in the gym? And I'm like, first of all, my goal is to show up. Boom. Exactly. Yeah. My head, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for coming on. Like I said, this has been a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys are taking away some of those tools, those websites. Um, grab yourself a study Bible, an Amplified Bible, and get yep. the Bible app on your um, your phone. I just actually downloaded during your sermon. I downloaded a new Bible memory app, so it shoots me some memory verses. Oh, that's cool. Um, every day, so I'm trying yeah. to do that. Trying to expand 
Um, so if not, just use Google. <laughs> Dude, honestly, Google, minus the fact that it's harvesting all our information right now as Dang it's listening it. to this podcast. Uh, we love it, Jesus, Google. It is great. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. All right, guys. We'll see you next time here right. on the 167. See you. Welcome back to Think Different. This is a fourth session on the book of Job. And we're really talking about the book of Job because a lot of people... They think it is something that it's really not. The book of Job, uh, in kind of review where we are at this point, is it's a book about a man who was the subject of suffering, and really it was because Satan, the accuser, um, was building a case against humanity and saying, hey, these people don't deserve you. And he went before God and he said, hey, listen, if you stop giving them good things, they will stop loving you. And he says, no, 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 not my boy Job. Job's not like that. And Satan says, no, he's like that. So God says, okay, we're going to suspend kind of the the normal thing of, you know, if you're doing what God's will is in your life, then it has really good natural consequences a lot of the times. It comes with some blessings and some promises. And so he suspends that, pr- removes his hand of protection, lets the accuser kind of throw whatever he wants at him, you know, put him on the stand and uh, have at him. And so Job loses his kids. He loses everything that he owns. His wife has kind of done with him. He's sitting in a pile of ash. And last week we talked about Job's argument towards God, which is he says, this is not my fault. I'm righteous before you, which God admitted that he was. And so Job is wanting God to stand up and say, and come in person to tell him what is going on. But instead what happens is Job has three friends that come and they each have three different arguments that center around the same thing, which is really the idea of that God is just. And so we, what we've been really wrestling with in Job is the idea of is God just and is he good? Because what we've really been talking about is the conclusion is that most people come out this book with is if God is just and good, then when I am wise and good, I receive good things. And when I am bad and stupid, I receive bad things. And we've talked about how that's not really a theme of the Bible. And yet so many Christ followers pursue this and persist in it by saying something's going wrong in my life. God must be trying to get my attention. God must be punishing me. God's doing this on purpose. It's his will that I suffer. And there's all of these terrible things that we as Christ followers, it drives us to these conclusions that when something bad and random happens in our lives, a lot of times we forsake our faith because we don't know how to wrestle through that because either God is a just God and a loving God, and these things shouldn't happen to me because I'm a good person or I'm, I'm righteous, or God is negligent and he's not protecting me even though I'm doing what God wants. And so um, or God's just vicious and he's mean and he's punishing me. And so Job had kind of... Uh, kind of puts his case forward in this kind of play that we're looking at. And he says, listen, I think that I'm righteous. And since I'm righteous, this has to be for some other reason, right? And so we could even argue that as New Testament Christians, as we say, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, if I'm being punished, something else must be going on. God is doing this to me. God, something is is wrong. God is punishing me. You know, God is not just, and he's not loving to, towards me. He's testing me. He's doing whatever it is. And so we we put together some pretty weird stuff as Christ followers. It's like, well, yeah, you know, like I'm righteous. And so there's nothing that I could have possibly done wrong. Therefore, God is trying to do this. He's, um, he's given me a disease. He's uh, taken someone out of my life because really he's just trying to build my character. And, it, and it, it comes off as that God is this really kind of unloving person towards us or has an unloving um, affection towards us. But Job's three friends come into this um, this uh, play or this um, story, whatever you want to say that it is. Um, I actually believe it's a true event, but it is formatted like a play. And there's Eliphaz the Temanite, Bilidad the Shuite, and Zophar the uh, Namathanite if I'm saying that right. Um, And really, all three of them kind of give their perspective on what they think about Job. But really, what it boils down to is they think that Job has some kind of hidden sin in his life. Their conclusion is that God is just. God is just and God is good. So you cannot question God's goodness and his judgment. A good God would not be unfair. And so it's kind of these logical fallacies where Job says, well, I'm good, therefore the problem must be with God. And they say, well, no, God is good, so the problem, therefore, must be with you because God doesn't behave unfairly. God, um, you know, God wouldn't do this. It's not unfair. 
like, and really there's, there is this argument and this ongoing argument in our culture and with Christians, uh, where we talk about if God is fair and with my own kids, I always tell them that fairness is not a thing. Like we're into justice. Justice is when people get what they deserve. Um, and really we're not really into that because we're into grace. And so fairness is always, um, something that people want until they actually don't deserve a good thing. And then they don't want it to be fair. They want grace. And so the conclusion that you have with Job's friends, they, they'll give like this dissertation about what they think and their logical argument. And then Job will rebut them. And then, and he keeps going back to his arguments He's like, no, I'm righteous. I haven't done anything. But what they keep coming back to is that his suffering is divine punishment. And a lot of times we end up here as Christ followers as well. You must have done something wrong to upset God. It might've been an accident. It could be a secret sin that you're hiding from everybody else. It could be, you don't have enough faith. Like people manifest this in a, in a number of different ways. So, and what it boils down to is it's kind of a rebuttal to the new Testament, even though I'm forgiven and I'm covered in the blood of Jesus, God is still holding a grudge in order to be a fair God, right? Like, because, you know, our grace should cover us, right? If, if I, if we say that Jesus Christ, his blood covers every sin that I've ever done and every sin that I ever will do, then I'm not owed any punishment, because Christ paid for it. We talked about this a little bit in the last time. It's kind of like double jeopardy. There was this movie uh, that came out, I know, a while ago with Ashley Judd. And, and the premise of the movie was that Ashley Judd, um, she is convicted of killing her husband, even though he faked his own death. So he faked his own death. She's convicted of killing him. She serves time in jail for killing him. She gets out of prison and discovers that he's still alive. And so technically, legally through the law, she could shoot him on Main Street and nobody could and nobody could do anything about it because she's already served time for the crime. And so this works in the same way where Jesus Christ has already paid for our crimes. Therefore, even if we are guilty of our sin, we do not pay the penalty for that sin. So he's covered us like he's paid the, the cost for that. But this idea that Job's friends kind of put forward and where we end up as Christians with as well is that when I suffer because of my sin, like in some ways that is double punishment. So God cannot be just and say, well, Christ covers your sin, but I'm also going to punish you for your sin. God's not punishing you. Like it is a theological fallacy to say that God is punishing you for sin if you are a forgiven follower of Jesus Christ. Now you might suffer consequences for your sin. Like if I rob a bank, even though God forgives me, I'm probably still going to do jail time because the world hasn't forgiven me. You know, if you... um get in a fight, you know, you're still going to have bruises from that. So there are some of those kind of things that happen. If you are irresponsible with money, you know, God might forgive you of greed, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the bank's going to, you know, call off your loan. So there are some of those things to be fair, but when we talk about God um, and we talk about his justice and his fairness, Job's friends are arguing that Job has some kind of secret sin that God is punishing him for. And he keeps rebutting them and saying, no, 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 I'm righteous. And we, as the outside people know, because in the beginning, God says, here's my, my servant Job, none is as righteous as he is. So we know that Job is actually right about that. He's not right in his argument, but he is right that he's righteous. And so we have these people that their conclusion is that God runs the world according to justice, or he is just, therefore, Job has to have some secrets in that he's being punished for. And so this is almost an argument in the modern Christianity that you don't have enough faith argument, right? You know, the reason that God's not healing you, the reason that God's not intervening in this thing, the reason that God's not, um, you know, delaying your suffering, the reason he's allowing you to suffer, the reason he didn't save you from a car wreck, the reason that he didn't um, save your loved one from death is because you don't have enough faith. You are doing something to prohibit God. And that's just not true. Like Christ, either Christ's blood is enough or it's not. And so this is also a strange belief that Christians have because we believe that we are forgiven and yet still punished. Like, just think about that for a second, that in one sentence you would say, Christ has completely forgiven me and paid the cost for my sin, but also because I sin, God is punishing me. Like that doesn't make any sense. And I know that Job is existing in a time where basically, you know, Christ has not come yet, but by, that, by their standards at that time, whether he's offering sacrifices, he's righteous. And so his friends are trying to convince him that he's not righteous. 
So both Job and his friend's argument drive people away from God because in those scenarios, whether God is punishing me doubly for my sin, that makes God mean. And whether or not, you know, I'm righteous, but God's punishing me anyway, then God's mean. Or God is here to remind me that I'm a terrible person. You know, he's sending these punishments to remind me that I owe him something. So it's kind of this idea, you're going to go to heaven someday, but while you're on earth, you're still subject to punishment. And so Christ's grace and forgiveness does not kick in until the afterlife. And I don't believe that the New Testament tells us that either of those things are true. And so, like I said, a lot of people use the story of Job to distance themselves from God. And they say, why would God allow suffering? Look, you know, in, in Job, you know, I feel like Job. And really, like I said, I do believe that God's going to answer this question for us because we're getting to that last part. There's one last friend that's going to show up and talk to Job before God shows up and answers him. But I think that we should be very careful. And as you go in and study this, you can study each one of the friends' kind of rebuttals to this, that their argument about Job. Um, but it's this crazy argument. And like I said, and just be careful with this argument that God is punishing you for your sins if you are a forgiven um, person in Jesus Christ. Like, I think that we suffer in sin and we're subject to Satan when and subject to the accuser when we don't have Christ. But once you have Christ in your life, Christ died for you. So to say that God is then punishing you for your sin makes God unjust and unfair and really kind of cruel because it's double jeopardy. He's punishing you and his son Jesus. Why on earth would he send his son Jesus and punish his son Jesus if he was going to punish you anyway? Just something to think about this week. And the next week we'll come back and talk about Job's last friend, Elihu the Boozite. If you enjoyed this episode of The 167, make sure you like, subscribe, follow, get notified, leave a five-star rating and a positive review. Tell all your friends to listen as well. Make sure you go over to newlifegardener.com and check out all that we have to offer as a church and check out our messages online as well. Thanks for listening.